Hey, well, I appreciate everybody coming out. Hope everybody's enjoying the conference so far. It's like a lot of great content. Uh, I hadn't got to see as much of it as I wanted, so I'll be waiting for the, the recordings, unfortunately. All right, so the topic today is executing commands uh, remotely and then getting the output using just WMI. So um, the original problem uh, that I had years ago, and I, I've been in, I won't get into details about me. Uh, long story short, I've been in IT for 25 plus years. Uh, a lot of administrative scripting from batch files to VBScript to PowerShell, now .NET development as well. Um, and so I've been in a lot of different uh, small environments, a lot of huge environments. Anyway, I needed to run scripts, command line tools on remote uh, workstations, servers. Uh, also needed to do it in bulk, you know, not just one at a time. And then I uh, wanted to get the remote command output, so like standard out, standard error, if you think back to like the, the batch file days. Um, the, the problem was uh, there wasn't really many options back then. Now, I'll preface all this with saying what I'm going to show you here in a little bit uh, using WMI, you know, I wouldn't recommend that for the, the average scenario today. This is more of like a novel approach that I came up with. Um, you know, everybody's using WinRM now. That's the way to go. I think that's actually might be changing, but, uh, you know, that's a whole other story. Um, but yeah, I, I, this isn't something I would say, hey, use this in production. Now, I have seen people use this in production. We have customers that use this in production in environments where uh, WinRM is blocked. So it's, it's, it's viable, but you know, I just wanted to lay that out there. So if we look at like uh, the existing solutions, so you know, of course, logging into machines, RDP, nobody wants to do that. But that was one way to do it back in the day. Uh, and even, in fact, I didn't even think about it, but going back further than that, you know, VNC or you know, think of your other uh, remote control technologies that, you know, people hate. At least RDP is cool, but uh, definitely don't want to RDP into five machines, much less 5,000 machines. Um, and then you got Win32 process create, which should be on its own bullet point, but it's not. We won't worry about that. Um, you know, and that's where you would take uh, the Win32 process uh, class in WMI <clears throat> and use the built-in method to create a process. So you can create processes locally, you can create them remotely. Uh, works great, awesome, does everything you need it to do except bring you back the output when you execute it remotely. I uh, have no idea why they didn't include that, but they didn't. Uh, and then PSExec. Now, PSExec was a valid solution. Uh, you use PSExec from, you know, Mark Rosanovich. Uh, everybody knows him. He's awesome, super smart guy. Uh, you launch PSExec execute something remotely. What happens in the background is it creates a service, executes the command, returns it back. A lot of great uses, used it a lot over the years, still used it in some cases. Uh, then uh, another technique, scheduled tasks. A lot of people don't really use that, but you can really get away with some, some cool stuff in some tight situations, especially in legacy environments, by using the scheduled task uh, command line tool. So basically you uh, create uh, a remote task, or basically, you would, you would copy your scripts out to the target machines, assuming you got SMB enabled, which most people do. You would use scheduled task EXE to then uh, create a remote task to execute that, and then have that task either send the data back to you or you go pick it up, um, or send, put it somewhere remotely on a share, or you know, write it to a DB, or whatever your, your, your use case is. Uh, and actually, that's making me think if I step back a, a step, going back to Win32 process create, there's another technique you could do with that one where you have the remote process, you know, write the output to a log file. And then you go grab the log file. I've done that before. You know, it works, but it's clunky and it's not very, you know, very elegant. Uh, then, of course, we have, you know, WinRM, PowerShell remoting. Okay, that, that's what everybody should be using, you know, today, the modern days, not, not the old heads like me. Uh, and then, of course, SSH. Um, if you can do that, then sure, you can do, you know, remote commands, get the output, just like you would on, like, a Linux box or something. So a lot of different solutions out there. I'm sure I've probably even missed some in this list. Uh, but none of them, with the exception like PSExec, would solve the problem I needed. Yeah? Quick question. In modern day, like WinRM, all these companies, security is at the one and eight ball. So like Microsoft, my agency manager, found the client, let's say 500. Mm. They're offline. They're not in domain whatsoever. You can't even contact. Yeah.
Yeah, so, so the question was, if you're like most, most organizations of security doesn't want to enable WinRM, and then if you're using like Intune or something, you got machines that are offline at different times, yeah. right? Um, so, so in those cases, obviously you can't use WinRM. What I would say is um, kind of build the use cases to show the benefits of WinRM, uh, you know, secure by default, encrypted by default. Um, it's the, the modern standard backed by Microsoft. Uh, and there's plenty of great videos out there by like Mike Kanakos and other folks uh, that you'll see up here that have done talks on that of why it's a good thing to do and how to present that to your InfoSec teams. Um, now, an alternative to that is the solution I'm going to show you here in a minute, WMI Exec. So if you can't get WinRM enabled, you could actually use the solution to execute stuff remotely, get, this, get data back. But now in an in a, uh, offline situation, that's, that's a whole different scenario. So, you know, so what we're focusing on right now is just like you're able to hit, hit a machine that's actually online and you have network connectivity to it. Yeah. Well, no, you could do, you could do um, work group as well, but you'd have to have local accounts with the same password on, on both the source and the targets. So it's, it's doable, but obviously a much better scenario with AD. Any, any other questions so far? Feel free to uh, cut me off at any point with questions, by the way. All right, so the other approach I talked about, WMI exec. So, and then we're going to do it with PowerShell. It's notable that the, the actual code that I wrote to do this, you could do with anything that, that could execute WMI. So you could go back and do this in VBScript or something. All right. So let me switch over. So we'll, we'll actually go through. So I've, I've got a couple machines here. Couple of VMs. I hope can everybody read that okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm just going to execute a few commands here. Now the scenario is I'm on one machine. I'm trying to talk to another machine, and the other machine has, you know, everything turned off basically except for WMI. So it, to, and to just prove that, we're going to run some commands here. So uh, I say everything except uh, I think ICMP is still on, but we'll ping it just to show it's there. All right, so. Got a ping reply. Um, and then I think SMB is there. And then let's try to do uh, PS exec. All right, so PS exec failed. Uh, and now, if you didn't know, PS exec, it requires the administrative share to be enabled to work. So like admin dollar sign. So I literally just de deleted the admin, uh, admin dollar sign share on the target machine just so we could show like, okay, you know, if security actually locked down PS exec, which that wouldn't be the way they would do it, hopefully. Uh, there's some other methods you could do. If they had it locked down where you couldn't run it, then, you know, th this would be like, like I said, an alternative. So now let's, uh, let's just check the uh, WinRM service on that machine. And we can see it's stopped. So actually, I, don't, I didn't have a command here for that, but let's just, let's try an evoke command um, on that remote machine. Uh, and we'll just get the, the host name back that should be on the, the target. While we're waiting on that, to tell you a little bit more about myself, uh, if, if I didn't mention, my name is Jay Adams. Uh, it's back, but you know I like automating processes and taking long walks on the beach. So if you guys want to share anything about yourselves, just let me know. So, all right. So we can see we got a fail. You know, obviously because we saw before that when our remit stopped. So just imagine again if this was a case like you said where security won't enable it, you can't do, you know, remote commands through WinRM. All right. So now let's. I've, I've already got the WMI exec script. Uh, on here. So let's try it out. We're going to run that same command. So we're basically um, uh, invoking WMI exec and then passing a computer name and then we're just doing host name as the command. But this, you know, we could do more than that. All right. So if you see here it executed. Uh, you can see where it's, that's the remote PID that we got and it's waiting for that command to finish. And here was the result, so that, that remote host name. Um, 
but that could be, you know, other commands like, um, you know, let's say, uh, let's look at the C drive, and then let's also say, who am I? All right. So again, we can see, you know, commands are actually executing remotely. Uh, we're getting all the output back, but WinRM, PowerShell remoting is disabled. We can't hit it with PS Exec, all the other standard stuff. You know, we could go through schedule tasks and all that too, but I think you kind of get the point there. Um, so like, what's, what's happening, right? So just to kind of give you some more uh, backstory, um, so what happened, um, oops, what happened uh, several years ago, um, like I said, I, I did tons of research, looked online, tried to find a solution, couldn't find anything at all. Uh, and just, it just kept nagging me that, you know, I've used WMI for years and tons of different scenarios, but I can't find a way to get this data back. And so it kind of just moved to the back burner for a long time. And then a few years, about three years ago, I guess now, um, it kind of resurfaced. I said, well, let me take another, you know, look at it with, with hopefully fresh eyes. And it kind of dawned on me. I was like, okay, WMI is basically a database running inside Windows. Um, you know, I write to da databases all the time, so I should be able to, you know, you're querying the database. You're basically, when you do WMI queries, you're querying the database, uh, the uh, SIM database. So why can't I create a table, create my own fields, store information in it? So that's kind of the mindset I took, and I started doing some deeper research in, in, the, in that context, and that kind of got me to where I, I figured out uh, how to do it. So if we'll just kind of step through the code here. This is going to be super awesome and not boring. Uh, so <laughs> we'll start down here. So we kick off like there's a, uh, a function called main, right? So now if you remember, our, we had two command line parameters, computer name and command, right? So here we're just popping this command into a different variable. I can't even remember why I did that, but there was a good reason. So command string is whatever the command is that you want to execute, right? So we got another function here called create script instance, okay? And what we're going to do is run that against the target computer to get a, a GUID back for this, this custom class that we're going to create. And that's, that's really the, the, um, the essence of how this works is we're going to create our own custom class in WMI to do whatever it is we want to do. And, and what I'm showing you here is just a very small sliver of what you could do. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole lot more, uh, further that you could take this. So let's go over the create script instance. And so we're going to do, we've got this variable called class check. And what we're doing here is we're using WMI to see if this custom class that I've called noxygen underscore WMI exec, uh, we're going to see if that custom class already exists on the target machine. All right. Uh, and if it doesn't, so it comes back as null, then we're going to go through the process to create it. Um, so here we got new class variable. So we're creating a new object. And you'll recognize here we're using some .NET stuff. So we, we go to the sim v2 namespace um, to, to create like a new class object. And then we start populating some of the properties on that. And all this stuff, all these properties uh, and everything, uh, the methods and whatnot, if you look through the WMI documentation, it's all been there. It's all been there for years before I f found this out, uh, which makes me feel very stupid. Uh, but uh, it's all there. So we said our class name is that Noxygen underscore WMI exec. Um, and then we set up the static qualifier, and then we s create a property called command ID. Now, the command ID is what we're going to use as a, like a unique reference. You can think of it like a primary key in your uh, database table. And so I'm going to use that as a reference to whatever it is that I'm going to try to do on the target. All right. Uh, and so, and, and you can see here where we mark the qualifier, we mark it as like a key, so basically like a primary key. Um, and then we're going to add another property called command output. This is where we're going to store the actual output, the remote output, uh, from the remote command. All right, and so then we call this put method, and that basically means we, we're basically creating this custom class with these properties uh, on the target. All right, and then here we create an instance. So we're going to set up an instance of that new class that we just created. Um, and then when you call this get type, and I, I, I hate that I don't 
I, I should have, uh, I honestly don't remember <laughs> exactly what the get type's doing, but it, it's basically, it's, it's required to actually make this, like, be effective, if you will, almost like saving it. Um, and I should have, I should have pulled that back up before, uh, before we uh, did this demo, so I apologize. But you call that, that basically kind of like makes it effective or saves it, if you will. And then uh, we set up this command ID, and we take that instance that we just created, and then pipe it over to uh, select object, and then we're looking for the property of that command ID for this, this unique instance of the remote command that we're executing. All right, and then we call dispose on the instance to, to get rid of that particular instance. Then we're going to return the command ID back to that original call that we made. All right, so if we go back to um, here, so this is where we're coming back. So we called, we just called that create script instance, did all that stuff, and now we've got the GUID back for this particular um, uh, for our WMI class. All right, so now we're going to go down, and we've got. Uh, this encoded command. So if look at the notes here. So it says, you know, we're going to execute the command, store the output as a string, um, and then get a reference to th this custom class that just, we just created. All right. So the encoded command. If you're who's familiar with like the ability to like encode commands for PowerShell. Yeah. So this that's all we're doing here. We're, we're creating this command line. We're just encoding it. Um, just to make so we don't have to deal with all the nuances of like special characters and all this other stuff. So we got a result variable, we do invoke command, um, and then here's our script block. And then remember the command string, that's where we stored the command that the user typed in at the command line to, to send over. And then we take that output, out string, and then at, right after that, we call, we basically do a get WMI object on our custom class, just like we do with any other like win32 underscore process, service, whatever. But then we filter it based off of that command ID. So we say, only give me the results back where the command ID property of that class equals the command ID of this unique instance I ran. So let's say, you know, the other folks in your team like using the same script and they're all running it, you make sure you're not grabbing everybody else's command or whoever. So we're just using that as to filter out exactly what we call. All right, and then now we take this in, uh, encoded command and we uh, grab the bytes for it and then uh, convert it to base64 string just so it's nice and clean on the command line. We again, we don't have to worry about anything blowing up on us. All right, and now we're going to actually run the command uh, on the target host. So here we call this exec command function. Uh, let's go look at that real quick. Let's make sure we're doing okay on time. Um, and so here, you know, it says we're going to pass the entire remote command as a base64 encoded string to PowerShell on the remote box. And so here's the actual command line that's going to, and, and I've got a lot of this stuff, uh, I've just made it multi-line so it's easier for you guys to see it on here, you know. So if you see like code uh, inconsistencies, apologize, this is pseudo. Um, so we're going to call PowerShell.exe. Um, and do, do a couple switches to kind of clean everything up so don't show the logo. We want to make it non-interactive so we don't want anything popping up for that remote user uh, if something happens. And then we're setting the execution policy to unrestrict it so we can you know, bypass anything uh, keeping us from running. And then we're setting the window style to hidden so it doesn't pop up for the user either. Yeah, e either. And then there's that special switch called encoded command which says, hey, send me this, uh, you know, this encoded command that you've, you've uh, set up. So then we pass that in from the previous call. Now, we've got, after that, we've got a variable called process where we're going to get a reference to the process that, uh, that we're actually firing off. And you'll see here, we're doing invoke WMI method, and we're using 132 process. Where you're like, hey, I, I thought 132 process you know, couldn't, couldn't solve the problem. Well, it never could, but we're still going to use it because we know it's going to be there on every machine we talk to. And so we can reliably create processes remotely, but we're still going to use this extra layer uh, to, uh, you know, like, send it with our custom WMI uh, class to send the commands over and get all the data back. So we use Win32 process to, and we call the create method on it. And so we create a remote process and then we pass it this command line, which includes, you know, the PowerShell call and then all the encoded command that the user passed in. And then we execute that remotely. And then 
we start waiting for the results back. So you remember when it was showing like the PID and it says waiting for the you know, remote results. So we wait a couple minutes here uh, for that to execute. And then while we're doing that, uh, each loop, we're just uh, you know, querying uh, 132 process to see when that PID is done. All right, once it's done, we'll let the user know. And then now we want to go back and make another call back to the target machine to our custom the WMI class and get the results back from that remote command because it's still sitting out there in, in the WMI database on the remote machine. So let's call uh, this get script output uh, function. So here we're, we're getting another instance. So we're just making a call, get WMI object call to our custom class. Um, and again, we're filtering on that command ID so we're getting what we call. And then we're going to do a select object on it and expand that command output property, which has the, you know, the results from the remote command. Uh, then we're going to remove that object because we don't want to clutter up the, the, the remote WMI database with our own custom stuff. Uh, and then we're going to return the results from that command. All right, so. Yeah, so, and then basically we return the results back to the, to the user. So, you know, I've talked, to, uh, <laughs> talked quite a bit about the history behind it, the reasoning, all, all that, and it's on purpose because the surprising thing is, like, once you see how it works, it's surprisingly easy, so there's really not a whole lot to it. Um, like I said, this is more of like a novel approach that I thought was pretty cool. It was really a big win for me just because it was something I, I never figured out years before. Um, and what was even more demoralizing actually was uh, when I open sourced it and put it out on Twitter and announced it, somehow I, I started seeing other projects uh, that were all hacker type projects for like command and control stuff that were using a similar technique to this that had been out for a few years. But somehow I had never ever seen them. And I consider myself a great Google searcher. You know what I mean? <laughs> so. Uh, but, you know, I got some positive feedback from folks and, hey, you know, it's, it's cool that you figured it out on your own anyway without knowing about the other stuff. So I was, I was proud about that. So anyway, but uh, like I said, it's not something I would, you know, recommend per se in production. But if you're in an environment where you can't get WinRM enabled or you're in some kind of quirky scenarios or whatever, it works reliably. And it's way, uh, one thing I will say about the other solutions that I've seen out there from different like hacker groups and pen test groups and stuff like that is this solution is way simpler. I mean, we're talking, you know, uh, 176 lines, and a lot of that's comments and stuff like that. Uh, you know, there's no dependencies. Again, it's uh, WMI, and you can do it with PowerShell or VBScript or even, like, JavaScript if you wanted to. Um, so, yeah, with that, like, what questions do you guys have? Um, happy to answer. How do we know it's serialized and not just a script? So, again, Simplicity. So when I first started this out, that was like the first iteration of it. So for me, when I develop stuff, I'll kind of do it in phases. I'll do like a you know kind of a basic iteration, proof of concept, see the small building blocks, get it to work, right? And so that's the phase I, I wanted to put it out there, starting out on uh, GitHub. And so to be completely transparent with you, then life got back into place. Uh, working on this new version of System Frontier got back into place. Uh, but yeah, a lot of stuff. So yeah, there's a, there's a ton more stuff I'd like to extend it or if people want to contribute to, to the, um, yeah, to, to the project and stuff. Because um, so like I said, it's out there on GitHub, um, you know, under uh, one script or WMI exec. But yeah, there's things like uh, I had actually started because somebody posted about, well, what, I wonder if you could uh, do file copies. And I was like, yeah, you sure could. So I started working on an update where you could do actual file transfers just through WMI, uh, just like we did here with everything else disabled. Uh, and I, um, so stuff like that I wanted to update the, the repo with. Um, things like uh, providing credentials, you could totally do like, um, uh, like PS credentials, uh, package that all up, use it, run it. Now, what that won't do though is solve the, the is anybody familiar with the second hot problem? Ever heard? Yeah. So this won't solve the second hot problem. That's a whole other thing. Uh, but there's other solutions for that as well. But yeah, there, there's a ton of things that you could take this basic concept and then extend it to do some really cool, way more complex stuff. Yeah. And the serialization would be sweet because then when you get it back, you could just manage it like objects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so second hop is a classic scenario where 
uh, let's say I need to connect to server A, right? And I can query, do stuff remotely with my credentials or alternate credentials, works great. But now, once I connect to server A, I need to go do something from there to server B. So the first hop, second hop. When I do that second hop, by default, my credentials will not traverse over to the second hop. So all right, I basically have no network connectivity. And so you've got, there's, there's a few different ways you can do it, more ways you can do it now with like WinRM and things like that um, to get around that. But that's, that's like a problem that's been around for a long time. Uh, that's a, yeah, so does that make sense or? Okay. What other questions you guys have? I know somebody's excited to try to do this with batch files. If you are, let, meet me afterwards. So, yeah. It'll persist until, unless you remove it. I explicitly remove it just because I don't want to like clutter up anything. Right. Um, and, and when I initially created this, I wasn't 100% sure like how volatile it might be. I didn't do like extensive tests, and you notice there was no like uh, try catches in that code or anything else. You know, this was just really basic, very terse. Um, but yeah, to, if I did like, a lot further testing. I would check to see, okay, is, I know it persists uh, during that session or like while the machine's up, but what about when it reboots? I haven't tested it. I'm sorry, what? Uh, no, it removes the class. Yeah, no, you're yeah, you're right, you're right, yeah. So it's been like I said, it's been a <laughs> it's been a few years. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so you try to remove the the the, the instance, but yeah, sometimes the class. In fact, you bring back those memories now. Yeah, I can remember in some instances. It's, talk about the volatility. I think sometimes the class wouldn't remain, and I'm not 100% sure, you know, why that's the case. Um, so I, and I, it's probably due to, I'm, there's probably some other properties that you probably really should be setting that maybe I wasn't in those in, initial you know, proof of concepts. But, yeah. well, any other questions, feedback, anything? Uh, hey, I appreciate it, man. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, sorry, what do you say? Oh, awesome. Yeah, like I said, uh, this. Several co uh, companies that we know that use it, we get hits all the time from, uh, uh, I'd say, probably very nefarious looking IP addresses that, that pull up the, the blog uh, about it. So, uh, you know, hopefully it's being used for good out there, but, you know, who knows. Um, but, yeah, so you can check out the repo. Uh, if you want to make changes, contribute, go for it. I'd love to, to see people take it further. Um, you can reach me at uh, one scripter on Twitter. And then, um, you know, we're the platinum sponsor of the event. Appreciate everybody coming out. Uh, if you want to do, like, way more cool stuff and, and do even more, like PowerShell GUIs, RBAC, and all that for your scripts, uh, check out System Frontier. And just go to systemfrontier.com slash PowerShell. So unless anybody has anything else, I really appreciate your time. And uh, hit me up afterwards if you, if you want to talk uh, more. All right. Cool. Thank you.